How's life at 70? Um, well, I never thought I would get this far, first of all. And um, my health is relatively good, so that I have no major issues confronting me. Uh, no life-threatening illnesses, diseases, anything of that sort. Um, my body is not as uh, spry and strong as it used to be. But all that aside, um, having come to this, what I always thought of as a young person, an old age, I, I feel that um, my days are dwindling no matter what. And because there are fewer days left, I, I seem to be taking greater pleasure in being alive than ever. I mean, really appreciating it. And so, in some sense, even though there is the daily struggle and pushing and pulling and conflicts that one has to deal with, I think I feel happier than I've ever felt in my life now. Your father died at 67, I think? 66, 66. yeah. 66. Um, are you, say, you're enjoying life more, um, but is death a concern? Do you feel time running out? Do I feel time running out? Well, yes, but again, the, the wonderful thing about it is that you have no idea when it's going to happen. I was asked a um, uh, question, um, you know, these silly things that uh, uh, magazines ask you, and I think it was a Canadian newspaper. I, I, I went to Canada about six months ago for my book, and it might have been the Globe and Mail, and they asked uh, all kinds of questions, and one of them was, would you ra if, you, if you could travel in time, would you rather go into the future or the past? And this is something I've thought about quite a bit. And, um, and I said, certainly the past. There's so many things I would like to see that you know, I know about. I said, wouldn't it be interesting to see the first performance of Antigone in ancient Greece or to see Abraham Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address or any number of thousands of possibles. But the future, what is the future for us? It's when we're going to die. And uh, then if I could travel into the future, I would know when I was going to die. And I don't want to know. I don't think anybody really wants to know. Um, so that's it. Yes, I'm going to die. And I've known that since I was three years old, but uh, not knowing when keeps every day uh, interesting. The reason I'm asking uh, is also a literary question, because yesterday at the conversation you said that all your books are your babies or your kids and you don't prefer anyone. Uh, but of course, realistically, uh, there's not an endless number of books left for you to write. And the last one you wrote, for three, two, one, is quite a thick book. Yes. Well, uh, no, of course I don't have an infinite number of books in front of me. I never did. Um, it's funny that when I first started out, my great ambition was to write one book. One book that I could feel good enough about to try to get it published. And then the, the greatest thing would be if someone wanted to publish it. That was all I ever aspired to, one book. And I had no idea that it would lead to more books, that, that you don't just write one book, that there are many things inside you, and one thing leads to another. I just didn't understand that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm still bubbling with ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not retiring. I'm, I'm continuing. I don't think I'll write a novel now. I want to take a pause from novel writing to get that big monster out of my system before I start writing fiction again. But I'm working on a, on a kind of biographical, uh, critical thing about an American writer that I care about a lot. And uh, I think I want to write a little book about that. And uh, so I'm deep in research and I'm taking notes and full of ideas and um, you know, can't wait to get back from all this traveling and, and really get into it. I've only written a few pages and the research 
I have more to do, but not that much. And then I'm going to just sink into to writing this book. Well, listen, uh, I don't think there's a human being alive who doesn't reflect on what could have been. Um, what if I had turned right that day instead of left? Um, I mean, I was talking about this in Norway the other day. Um, I've been married to Siri now 36 years. We've lived together. So it's more than half my life. Um, uh, I met her by just, it was almost statistically impossible that I could meet her because we knew only one person in the universe in common. But it so happened that I went to a poetry reading in New York in February of 1981, and um, she was there accompanied by this person I also knew a little bit, and he introduced us. Now, not only is that pretty remarkable, but I almost didn't go that night. I had just come back from a trip, and I was not sure that I had the that I wanted to go to this event, but I finally did go, and my whole life changed because of that. And if I hadn't been there, and if I hadn't met her, it's impossible for me to conceive of what my life would have been, but it certainly would have been hugely different. And our daughter, who's now 30 years old, never would have been born. This remarkable singer that Sophie is. And uh, you begin to think about this, and um, it's dizzying. And you think of all the moments in your life when you've made a choice to go to the reading or not to go to the reading, to go to this university instead of that university, to live in this town instead of that town, and all the things that can happen to you, not to speak of all the circumstances around you that are completely out of your control. A big storm will destroy your house, right? Uh, your, your most beloved friend or wife or husband or parent is killed in an accident. All the things that can happen and that change our lives abruptly, well, this book considers those alternative realities. So it's not that there are four lives, it's just parallel lives. So they're happening simultaneously but they all can't happen to any one person. You only have one life. And what happens to you is what happens to you. But it's, it's impossible not to contemplate other possibilities. Well, I've always thought of uh, writing or any art as a kind of illness. And you catch it pretty early in life. And um, you're condemned to do it. Your life will be unfulfilled if you don't do it, even though uh, it's very difficult and very, very demanding and takes a lot out of you. Um, so I don't really feel I have a choice. Um, and I think other writers and painters and musicians feel that way too. Um, and there are very few people, I think, who have a long life in art. You know, at 20, everyone's a poet, but at 30, not so. And at 50, they're just a few, etc. In all the arts, to, to keep going is, um, it's unusual. Um, and so the only explanation must mean that you're, you're obsessed and driven and you can't conceive of another kind of life. My curse was uh, um, wanting to write and feeling I had to write. And all kinds of writing, not just fiction and stories, but I've written uh, autobiographical work, I've written poetry, screenplays, many, many essays about things. Um, so, um, and it all interests me, and translations. I've, I've translated hundreds of poems uh, from French, and that's an activity I really enjoy. And I did a lot of it when I was young. But even in this new novel, um, I spent a long time working on a translation of The Pretty Redhead by Guillaume Apollinaire, which I think is one of the great poems of the early 20th century. And I have one of my Ferguson boys translating poems, and 
and I, it's attributed to him, but I did it. And um, I probably worked on that for a year. I would do a version, put it aside, and then a few weeks later, a month later, pick it up again, start making changes. And I, I kept reading it out loud to Siri, who's my great sounding board. And she'd say, oh, that's good. And then I, a month later, I'd say, well, what do you think about this interpretation of the line? And she'd say, oh, oh yeah, that's better. That's good. And this is, translation is like this. It doesn't come all at once. Um, and so I, I, I loved doing that. And, uh, and I've translated things in novels over the years. There's the Book of Illusions, long se sections of Chateaubriand's memoir. Uh, in Invisible, I translated a Provençal poem by Bertrand de Born, an amazing poet from the 1100s. Um, so I, I still find a lot of uh, satisfaction in doing that as well. Well, I don't know if I'm enthusiastic all the time. I'm, I'm um, uh, in it. In a, in a sense, I'm uh, almost unconscious of my own feelings. Uh, the, the extraordinary thing about writing, whether it's poetry or fiction or anything, you actually lose yourself. You leave yourself behind and you're in the, the work that you're doing, which is a very good thing, but you're not even aware of it. So you're inside this music is the way I think of it. Um, I think of writing as kind of a composition of sounds. And um, therefore, for me, since the paragraph is the unit of composition in a novel, the way a line is the unit in a poem, um, I work on a paragraph until it seems to have the proper rhythms and the proper balance and the proper um, mm, unexpected moments. Um, I mean to say, what's really important when you're writing is not just the sentence, but what happens after you put the period and you're about to write the next sentence. In other words, what kind of space do you want there to be between sentence A and sentence B? Do you want to move a couple of inches ahead? Do you want to leap several meters ahead? Or do you want to even fly miles ahead? It depends, uh, and you have to find this, this rhythm. So I work on the paragraph as if it's a little poem, as if it's a musical composition. And then when it seems to be more or less finished, at least I can't think of what to do with it anymore, I swivel around in my chair and I type it up on my typewriter because I write everything by hand first. So I have a typescript going and a manuscript going. And then I type it up and I can see it clean and then I say, ah, oh, no, I cross something out and I make some more changes. And then when I don't think I can do any more with it at that point, I put it in a folder and then I go back to the notebook and write the next paragraph. That's how I spend my time. My whole life has been spent doing that. <laughs> when the books um, are finished and published, they become part of the cultural heritage or even cultural debate. Um, Especially here in Europe, we have expectations to our writers. We, they are our intellectual conscience. Mm. And if we go to war, we would ask them for their opinion. Which role do you think literature should play within society? Which within role society? should the author play within society? I, uh, there are no rules about that. Uh, I can understand the um, desire of a writer to lock his door and never come out and never talk in public, never give a reading, never do an interview, and uh, just, just offer his work to the world for them to make what they will of it. Uh, I think that's a perfectly fine stance. I think um, the writer can spend his whole life writing about um, very small things, gardens and people sitting around having dinner and uh, whatever. This, this can make great art. 
But then there are other writers, uh, and I think it's fine if they want to speak out in public and um, get involved in the political and social issues of their day. It's fine. Just there, there are no rules about this. Now, what you're talking about really is not so much writers, but public intellectuals, uh, people that um, uh, society turns to to make comments about what's going on. Well, in the United States, nobody listens to writers. Nobody cares what a writer has to say. Uh, we are very marginalized. And uh, literature is a, uh, a pursuit that most people are not interested in. And if they ever stop to think about it, they don't respect it at all. I think it's kind of stupid and a waste of time. You know, we're a very practical country, right? And it's all about money, 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 money. That's what people love to think about. So since we don't have royalty and uh, we don't have public intellectuals, what we have in the United States are movie actors. And they're the stars of the society. And so when something happens, uh, uh, people like to hear what uh, uh, movie actors have to say, which seems uh, neither good nor bad, just bizarre, it seems to me. But that's how it works. Other countries, Europe, South America, it's different. And uh, they put writers on television, whereas American writers are never on television. Yeah. Uh, let's stay with the books. Uh, what's the difference between a literate society that is reading novels and poems and an illiterate society that looks at YouTube and the internet all the time? Well, um, literate society, I don't know. I think um, if you look back, uh, mass literacy is something very new in human life. Uh, it really didn't start until the late 18th, uh, into the 19th century. So it's recent. And uh, books were not accessible to most people. Life was hard, and people had to work, work, work in order to feed themselves and stay alive. And um, I think uh, when you think about, say, peasant cultures, older cultures, um, I think the great expressions of art in those worlds were music and dancing. I think this, this fulfilled some, some deep human need. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of time for people to sit around writing poems and novels or to read them. Songs, yes, the people would write songs. Uh, I don't even know if they wrote them down. They'd make them up and people would sing them. Um, so that's a form of literature, I guess, songs. But that seems to be very widespread throughout all cultures, even cultures, very, very primitive cultures with no books, no written language. Um, uh, back in the day, very few people read even in, ex in, 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 say, Elizabethan England, a great period of writing. But uh, the books were published, but only a few hundred people would read them. Most of the poems were just passed around in manuscript at the court. Um, and it wasn't until, yeah, I, I'd say late 18th, early 19th century, talking about England now and the growth of literacy and the growth of publishers and novel reading. But novels were considered dangerous and um, harmful. And uh, people especially warned against women reading because it would inspire um, um, them to think about things that were um, at once dangerous and also take away their thoughts from the duties of being a wife or a mother or a, or a daughter. Uh, and, um, and it was always connected to some kind of sexual, masturbatory fantasies that would be inspired by reading books. So a lot of people thought they were bad for you. <laughs> and um, so what is a literate society? I don't know. Um, it, you can't judge literature by numbers. 
because unlike other arts, it's just one person always encountering it. You read a book and it's just you and the author. You look at a painting, there could be a hundred people standing around with you, looking together. You go to a play, it's a, it's a public event. A movie's a public event. Dance performance. Anything else is to be shared with other people. But books are private. And that's why I think they're irreplaceable. Because um, I've said it before, but I believe it deeply. I feel a book is the only place in the world where two strangers can meet on terms of absolute intimacy. There's no other place. So whether a million people read a book or a hundred people read the book, it's always just one, 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 one. And you, you, know, you have that connection with this invisible author. And the author and the reader make the book together. And every reader reads a different book from every other reader. That's what's so wonderful about all this.